Ladies and gentlemen, today is May 7th, 2020, and on behalf of the director of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Mr. Jeffrey Mangelsdorf, and the entire staff of the USAHEC and the U.S. Army War College, welcome to the 2020 Dr. Brooks E. Kleber Memorial Lecture Series. We welcome listeners from all over the world to our live stream lecture event tonight. Remember that you can submit a question for our question and answer at the end of the lecture by either emailing the main USAC email address or posting to the comment thread for this event on our Facebook page. You can see those two links up on the screen right now. The USAHEC and the U.S. Army War College sponsor tonight's lecture to honor the memory of Dr. Brooks E. Kleber, former Deputy Chief Historian of the Office of the Chief of Military History. Dr. Kleber was the mentor to a generation of U.S. Army historians, and we remember his mentorship and leadership as the Army's history program has evolved into what we have today. Now, before I introduce tonight's speaker, please note that tonight's lecture is based on a paper he recently wrote in partnership with the USAHEC's Historical Services Division. You can download and read the paper at the USAHEC's website by navigating to the upcoming events page and clicking the link within tonight's event page. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Thomas Brusino is the Associate Professor of History in the Department of Military Strategy, Planning and Operations at the United States Army War College. He holds a PhD in military history from Ohio University and has been a historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History in Washington, D.C. and the U.S. Army Combat Studies Institute at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, as well as a professor at the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. Thomas Brusino. Thank you very much. Uh, as he uh, pointed out, I, I'm a professor here at the U.S. Army War College, which got me interested in this question of, of what do we do at an Army War College? Since I have to teach people here, I, it came up, it started to come up. How do I, how do I deal with that issue? How do, what are we trying to do when we develop uh, people uh, who have to go out there and, and fight and win our wars? So what are strategists? Uh, we talk about these as strategists. So the, the point of this paper tonight is going to be uh, based on this study I did on Dwight Eisenhower's year at the Army War College. But what I'm really gonna do is spend most of my time is sort of talk about this idea of how you develop strategists. Uh, and it's gonna be an argument, it's gonna have three parts. Uh, and and uh, starting, starting with uh, part one, uh, which I'm gonna make this point of it, you don't win wars on the fly. Uh, now I should, I should also begin, if you could put the slides on, please, for me. Um, so, so there's the overall uh, picture of it. There's a, there's a class at the War College. I should begin that I'm a fan uh, of Dwight Eisenhower, uh, maybe, even, maybe even a little bit more than just a fan of, of Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, this is a picture of my dog. Uh, his name is Ike. Uh, I put this up so that anybody who gets uh, too angry at anything I say will have this to look at and maybe, maybe I'll get some sympathy. Um, our guy Eisenhower, though, and, and I say this is a fan of Eisenhower, he begins his memoir, uh, Crusade in Europe, which everyone should read. It'd be a good starting point for be developing as a strategist. Uh, he begins his memoir of World War II by talking about just how unprepared the United States was for the war. Uh, this is a very common thing among, among uh, general officers to do this. It's a very common refrain it's about America's sorry state of preparation for the war. Um, and as a result, he kind of makes this case that the United States has to learn on the fly. Um, and he even says, and, and, and what ends up happening is this idea uh, that going from this utter inability to wage modern war uh, what he calls a situation of appalling danger, we go to unparalleled might in battle. Uh, he calls this transformation a miracle. A miracle. And it makes for a neat story, right? Uh, it does. Uh, and it's one that, that, that senior military leaders really like to tell, especially in peacetime, because it allows them to make an emotional argument for more resources in peace, uh, for defense. But it's also a trope that can blind us to some things. If we, if we buy this story that it's just this miraculous thing that happens and it's all about Americans learning on the fly, um, that uh, then we don't start asking other questions about how wars are won. So let's, let's look at, at, this, at this, what was accomplished, what this miracle consisted of. So here we have uh, World War II mobilization. Let's start with, let's look at some strategic numbers, military strategic numbers, and some, uh, for just a few minutes here. Let's start with people. A total of 16.1 million Americans served in World War II, 11.2 million in the Army, in the Air Force, 4.1 million in the Navy, 670,000 in the Marine Corps. This is 12% of the population of the United States. 
There were 12 million total in the service just in, in 1945 alone, active. The Navy went from 125,000 sailors in 1939 to 3.3 .3 million in 1945. The Army went from 189,000 in 1939 to 8.2 million in 1945. The Marines went from 19,000 Marines to, in 1939 to 475,000 in 1945. 10 million of these entered through the draft, selective service. 45 million were registered, and 10 million were drafted. The rest uh, were, were joined up one way or another. See some ideas of what this looked like. Production, manufacturing. The United States is military manufacturing. The United States produced during the war roughly 88,000 tanks, 29,500 in 1943 alone. That is more than Germany produced in the entire war, just in one year. 2.5 million trucks, more than 500,000 Jeeps, over 7,800 heavy artillery pieces, plus another 173,000 light field artillery guns, tank guns, howitzers, and anti-tank guns, 110,000 mortars, 500,000 bazookas, 2.6 million machine guns, 12.5 million rifles, 2 million submachine guns, 2.7 million pistols, 22.6 million helmets, 41.5 billion rounds of small arms ammunition, another 320 million rounds of artillery shells, 300, or 110 million grenades, 26 million combat boots, 260 million socks for the Army, and another 25 million black shoes for the Navy. 5.8 million short tons of aircraft bombs for the Air, for the Air Force and Navy. 1.3 million short tons of naval gun ammunition and rockets. 53,000 torpedoes and over 500,000 depth charges. Roughly 300,000 aircraft of all forms. Almost 100,000 bombers, almost 100,000 fighters, and over 23,000 transports. Over 76,000 ships, including sort of famously a, a, a large merchant fleet. 5,600 merchant ships produced during the war, including 2,600 of the famous Liberty ships. And then another 71,000 naval vessels, including uh, 64,000 landing vessels were the primary numbers, not counting the small boats, rubber boats. Uh, another 2,700 patrol and minecraft, and 1,200 other combatants, as you sort of see on this slide on the right here. Uh, eight battleships produced during the war, 48 cruisers, 18 heavy carriers, 125 escort carriers, 352 destroyers, 498 destroyer escorts, and 203 submarines. All of this leaves aside uh, all kinds of categories of military material, common and uncommon, ranging from, ranging from underwear to the Pentagon to atomic bombs. They produced it all. All of these forces, all of these, all these forces and material were deployed into at least four combined and joint theaters of war the European theater of operations, the North African, then the Med Mediterranean theater of operations, plus there was a Middle East uh, theater too, that's loosely connected. The Pacific theater of operations, which was split into areas, most famously the Pacific uh, Ocean areas and, and the Southwest Pacific area, and the China, Burma, India theater. Distributed into those theaters as army primary units were three army groups, 12 full field armies, 25 corps, and 89 divisions of all different forms, infantry, airborne, armored, cavalry, and one mountain. The Army Air Forces eventually had strategic headquarters for the continental United States, for Europe, for the Pacific, into, a, into which went 19 numbered air forces with associated support, sometimes broken into fighter and bomber commands of various wings. For combat, they went into groups. By 1945, there were 243 combat groups for bombardment, fighters, a composite of the both, cargo and reconnaissance. The Navy structure shifts a lot more, but they also uh, carve up the world uh, into areas, fleets, and task forces. They're broadly distributed between the Atlantic and the Pacific, with even-numbered fleets in the Atlantic and odd in the Pacific. No less than five such fleets were in operation in the Pacific at one time or another, and another three in the Atlantic. The Marine Corps was overwhelmingly in the Fleet Marine Force in the Pacific, which eventually consisted of two amphibious corps of three divisions each. Among other assets, the Marines also had four Marine aviation wings distributed throughout the theater on islands and with carrier groups. And this is just a very broad overview of the people, material, and general organization and deployment of these units. We haven't touched on what any of this means for the civilian workforce or existing industry or agriculture or raw materials such as oil, coal, ores, mineral, wood, and so on. What is more, we haven't even gotten into the why and wherefore of the large overall decision making for the war, the big things that we normally associate with strategy, stuff such as Germany first, allied planning disputes, Luzon versus Formosa, these sorts of things, let alone these big arrows on maps, which you kind of see here, uh, but although these are mostly just for movement things, um, 
big arrows on maps that we come to think of when, when we talk about strategy making for war. They did all of that too. Developing national and allied approaches for winning the war, developing coordinated theater strategies against Germany and Japan, crafting powerful, relentless joint campaigns across, around, and over vast distances of just about every type of terrain on planet Earth against powerful, experienced enemies dug in on the defensive and knowing that the Americans were coming. So think about all of that. Uh, you can come back to me if you'd like. Think about all of that. If you were responsible for making all of this happen, all of that, and more, where would you start? How would you do it? Do you think you could figure it out on the fly? So while it's a nice story that the United States was totally unprepared for World War II, and all Americans did was open this vast resource spigot and then improvise their way to victory, it just isn't true. But, but, but Eisenhower said it was true and Marshall said it was true. So do pretty much all of the military leaders. Yes, they did, but that's not all they said. If you look a little bit closer, and they say some other things too. In the midst of the war, George C. Marshall, the chief staff of the Army, uh, wrote in one of his reports, quote, the orderly step-by-step -step development which the Army has undergone cannot have been managed without the background of careful planning over a period of years. The framework for our Army today and its development through the growing pains in the early part of the emergency were laid during the period preceding Pearl Harbor. In matters of personnel, military intelligence, training, supply, and preparation of war plans, sound principles and policies had been established in preparation for just such an emergency as arose. You can go back to the slides, please. So just who was doing the plan, that planning? Who was doing this stuff? Who was developing these principles? Eisenhower said something about that. Among his overall lack of preparedness in his, in his argument that he says, he also says, the only Americans who thought about preparation for war were a few professionals in the armed forces and some far-seeing statesmen. So how did these few professionals in the armed forces know that there was a problem? How did they know what to do about it? Eisenhower had something to say about that too. When he got his job in Washington, D.C., when he, when he moves to the War Plans Division in Washington, D.C., it's one week after Pearl Harbor, it's a Sunday morning, he goes and meets with George C. Marshall uh, to, take over the, to, take, to go into the War Plans Division. And the chief of staff lays out the, the grim worldwide situation, focusing on Pacific and the Philippines, lays out, the, speaks for 20 minutes, and then asks of Eisenhower, what should be our general line of action? Uh, this is one of these great moments in history. It's a career-making moment. It's a, it, this is a, a history-changing moment. And Eisenhower recalls of this, and these are his words. The question before me was almost unlimited in its implications, and my qualifications for approaching it were probably those of the average hardworking Army officer of my age. Naturally, I had pursued the military courses of the Army school system. Soon after completing the War College in 1928, I went to serve as a special assistant in the office of the Assistant Secretary of War. I had been forced to examine worldwide military matters and to study concretely such, such subjects as the mobilization and composition of armies, the role of air forces and navies in war, tendencies toward mechanization, and the acute dependence of all elements of military life upon the industrial capacity of the nation. This is not the time to go into, into uh, Eisenhower's response. You go back to me if, you, if you'd like. It's not a time to go into, back into Eisenhower's response uh, to Marshall's question. Uh, we know how that turned out, uh, and, and all, all the better for the whole world. The point is that it did not happen by accident. Eisenhower did not do it, and Eisenhower did not do it alone. It took a whole bunch of these professionals, those people who were in that slide we were just looking at, uh, with similar qualifications to craft the strategies that won World War II. So what were those qualifications? How did they get them? You go back to the slides, please. So, so you don't win wars on the fly. So here's part two, uh, the second part of my argument here, uh, which is that we prepare for the jobs and situations that military, military strategists have in wars. Uh, this is the Army War College, uh, and, and this is my sort of long introductory way of getting around Eisenhower and what he did at the Army War College in the interwar period. In part because I simply don't, I don't want to just simply rehash the paper that I wrote. Uh, you, can, you can all go and read it, but instead I'm going to summarize some of the key points. Uh, to begin, I chose Eisenhower because he's Eisenhower, uh, and he's great, and we know how important he is. It's easy to see this. But also because his year at the Army War College is the 1927-1928 school year. Uh, it's right in the middle of the period. It represents a pretty good average of the type of curriculum all of the students got in that time. Uh, back then, the college was in Washington, D.C. Now it's in Carlisle Barracks, where I'm standing today, or in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where I'm standing today. Uh, it's, it's what it, it was in a spot that is now Fort McNair. Uh, the student body consisted of, of mid-career officers. Uh, here's a, a decent picture uh, of these guys. 
Uh, his class had 105 or so students, mostly majors and lieutenant colonels, although a little bit older uh, from the regular army, a handful of colonels there too. Uh, there were also nine naval officers, you can see in the picture, some of them. Uh, naval officers of different forms, six from the Navy and three from the Marine Corps. Uh, some National Guard students came for part of the year, and the faculty and staff had 47 officers of similar ranks to the students. Some were a bit more senior, uh, but not by much. Um, the focus of the curriculum for these guys, and I cannot beat this point home hard enough, uh, was on preparing officers for the types of jobs they would go into for the rest of their careers. As the orientation stated, these positions of high responsibility are the command of large combat forces in time of war, as confidential advisors and assistants to such commanders, that's the staff, and as military advisors and assistants to those high governmental civil officials who are charged by law with the responsibility of preserving the security of this nation. Uh, in these positions, the, gra the, the graduates were responsible for issues relating to both the preparation for war and the conduct of war, and so the course covered both. So uh, they got more specific in how they went about this. Uh, this is a pretty simple, this is a simplified version, but it does the, does the trick basically of showing what the War Department general staff looked like in the interwar period. And for those who don't know how the staff structure works, uh, for field staffs too, for the staffs of divisions and corps and field armies, um, this is the structure they settle on after World War I. Uh, so what they were preparing the guys for, more specifically the students at the War College, are commands of theaters of operation and field armies. On the staffs of these theaters of operation and field armies, in these specific roles, which you can see here, the G1 personnel, G2 intelligence, G3, oh, sound go out? Uh, G3 operations, G4 supply. Uh, at the, at the uh, War Department general staff level, there were, additional, there were a couple additional spots that they had to be prepared for. Uh, they had the addition of the War Plans Division, which did war planning, obviously. And uh, to be on the staff of the Assistant Secretary of War, who was responsible for industrial mobilization primarily. In other words, the curricular content came from what the officers needed to know to better perform in these actual jobs they would hold in these positions. Uh, there's, a, there's another thing is there's a basic philosophy behind all of this. Uh, commanders, so you, sometimes you get this, this distinction between command and staff. Uh, that, they didn't see that as a problem. Uh, what they talked about was the commanders had to be intimately familiar with all of the functions of these staff sections. They had to know how everybody did their job in all of these staff sections and how they worked together, more importantly, how they all came together. Uh, staff members had to understand their function through the perspective of the commander. Uh, they're assistant chiefs of staff. They're, they're meant to, to work through the, through the commander and how their function worked in concert with all of the others. Therefore, all of the students had to be familiar with command and all of the staff sections. Which brings us to, so how did they go through the year? So this is the calendar. I made a, I made a quick version of this calendar. Uh, I don't want to go into to, to too much detail. Um, but you understand with this idea of understanding that we need to, to teach people to, to do these types of jobs, how they broke down the curriculum makes perfect sense. Uh, you can see here they started in September. Uh, and they went and they broke down their courses into a war plans course, G1, G3, G4, Assistant Secretary of War, G2, Command, uh, War Plans and Command, back to Command again. I'll talk about what that means here in just a second. Um, uh, the, the war plans, the conduct of war portion of the course for Eisenhower's year was focused on a, uh, to, was on War Plan Red, which was to practice a defensive war against a great power, Great Britain. Uh, in recent years, you find conspiracy theorists who use War Plan Red uh, which has a, a crimson component uh, that, that brings in Canada to talk about how the United States was planning on invading Canada. Uh, that was not the intent of it. The United States had no plans to invade Canada, uh, no intention on, on invading Canada. They had plans for it, but the plans were only to practice what it would be like if they had to do it. Keeping in mind that in this period, coming out of World War I, all of the indicators from their political leaders was, was that they would never go back overseas again. Uh, to Europe to fight there again. So they needed to, but they needed to practice what a major war would look like. Great Britain provided a huge problem for them, especially if you had Canada in, so they planned for it. So they did that in uh, Eisenhower's year. They built, it, they built it around that particular problem in his year. In later years, they'd do other problems. War Plan Orange, very famously for Japan. Uh, the War Plans course, which you see first there, it was broken into two sections. The first part covered the purpose, scope, and content of national level war plans to include joint issues, mobilization, procurement, and overall deployment. So not just how we'd fight the war, but how we would get our stuff together for that war, how we'd deploy that war, how we'd procure material. 
the course, that course also provided a baseline strategic survey of the war making capacity of the United States. What can the United States do? And the military geography of the United States and its surroundings. Uh, Eisenhower uh, dealt, worked on that particular problem on this idea of the strategic survey of the United States. After the war plans course, they went into the G1 course, this course on personnel. And they study a wide range of issues. Uh, in recent years, it seems like G1 has sort of been downplayed, but at the time, it, was, it had a huge role in how they looked at problems uh, and, and from these high-level positions. Uh, so this, they studied uh, mobilization, assignment of officers in war, how selective service would work, uh, morale of troops, anti-war organizations, the effect that anti-war organ organizations would have on morale of troops. Uh, they looked at civil affairs, what the Army would do if it went into uh, troops on the ground, went into and did military government. And they talked, even talked about, and more specifically in war, they talked about what a G1 would do uh, in a, on campaign and the location of commanders in battle, the best spot for a commander in a battle, especially again coming out of World War I where there's this image of, of generals being too far from the front lines, not understanding what's going on. After that, they went to the G3 courses as operations. Uh, and they and it had a very broad mandate in that course. Uh, so they look at the role of what, what a G3 operations section does at all levels of command. Uh, they looked at the War Department general staff overall, evaluated the value of the War Department staff, general staff overall. This is what Eisenhower did in that course. They looked at the future of cavalry, new technologies, armor, artillery. They talked about the employment of the Air Corps, how it would work. Remember that at the time, the Air Force uh, was still the Air Corps and still within the Army. They looked at how training would go in the Army. Uh, in a very broad sense. They looked at mobilization and concentration plan, plans, how you'd mobilize troops and move them to where they needed to go. They looked at joint army and navy operations. And then they did a big study on the principles of war. Uh, the uh, G4 course followed that. That's on supply, logistics. Uh, this looks at the uh, very broad mandate again, war department budget, port regulations in the United States, how ports work railroad traffic, how it works, the organization of the G4 in the War Department itself and how it works in a, in a field army. They looked at the first army G4 in the Meuse-Argonne Offensive back in World War I. Uh, most of these have some historical component that they do too, these courses and, and, and studying these issues. They look at the G4 features in a whole bunch of specific wars and expeditions and they talk about relations with the Navy when it came to G4 activities for joint overseas operations. The Assistant Secretary of War course is next. It's sort of a weird position. Again, mo the, the biggest mistake they saw that the U.S. Army saw in World War I was their lack of preparedness for industrial mobilization. They needed to get out ahead of this. Uh, so they had the Assistant Secretary of War to cover some of this. Uh, this course covers industrial mobilization uh, all around the world, how foreign nations did it in the World War and how they might do it in the future. Uh, they looked at uh, mobilizing industrial organizations for wartime, what it, what it would take to convert the United States economy, United States industry. They looked at Navy Department war materials. They looked at raw materials needed for, for national defense. They talked about the Army and Navy Munitions Board, which worked on this issue too. Uh, they talked about war plans from the perspective of the Joint Board, this is Joint Army Navy Board, and the War Department General Staff. And they also talked in a very broad sense about uh, the administrative and economic war powers of the president in war. What could the president do in war? This is where you start to get these sort of extreme measures of powers that a president can take on in an emergency. Eisenhower was on that committee and mandated and, and suggested very broad powers for the president in the emergency. So with all of that as background, so you can kind of understand, you see that this, this takes them up to Christmas. That's the break you see there. A uh, very short break. They actually did their last thing on Christmas Eve. Uh, a little different from how we do things now. Uh, with all of this as background, they have a very good idea of what one country looks like, their country looks like, for how to, how to fight a war overall. So they jump over to uh, and start saying, this is why they push the G2 course on intelligence. Intelligence sort of looks at the other, uh, the other at, 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 uh, enemies, rivals out there in the world. So they, with this good outlook of how you review a, a, a country's military power, the United States, they start to study other for, uh, powers at this point. And so this course studies a wide variety of foreign nations and regions pretty much everyone you can think of, uh, with some, some deeper emphasis on a few others. They look at the principles of military intelligence and field units. They, talk, they, they take close looks at potential theaters of operation. What are the, the key geographic and climate, uh, climatological features of these, of these areas? They look at key factors in the world economy. So they do look at economics. They look at international law. They, study, they, do, they do very specific, deep uh, military estimates of, on Mexico, the British Empire, and Japan. They look at issues of censorship and publicity what we now call some things we have called strategic communication. They look at arms limitation, effects of arms limitation. Uh, they look at G2 functions and contributions in corps, field armies, and theater uh, general headquarters. 
And they look at possible alliances against the United States. They sort of imagine various alliances that could come up against the United States. Uh, from their perspective then, so G2, so see this big long course follows this. The longest course that they have broken into two parts is the command course. The first part is academic. It still fits in this preparation for war. The command course, and command ties all these functions together. These functions of the staff uh, are all tied together in the command course. So they look at, in the command course, they look at a whole bunch of things. Uh, they look at war and its principles, methods and doctrines, theory of war. That's what Eisenhower does in that course. They look at the system of high command. They look at employment of large units in concentration, attack, pursuit, defense, and movement uh, by railroad and truck mechanization, which is uh, just beginning or developing. The employment of cavalry, employment of air and anti-aircraft forces, employment of artillery, ordnance, tanks, chemical warfare, employment of signal, engineer, medical and train services, they look at joint landing operations, amphibious type attacks. They look at the, they study a bunch of historical examples too. They go back to the first army in the Meuse Argonne Offensive and some of the command issues with that. And then they do a whole bunch of uh, deep study in this sort of next section, it's sort of broken into two sections, uh, of a bunch of historical campaigns, including uh, studying all sides of the Napoleonic campaigns. They look at the Franco-Prussian War, the Russo-Japanese War, the American Civil War, and of course the World War, World War I. And from there, they go into the more practical war planning games and exercises and terrain and support, as you can see in that latter part of the war from April to the end, oh, I have February in there, it should, it should say February, but uh, from April to uh, from April to June when they, when they graduate and they start working on war plan red, on fighting it out. Uh, you can go back to me. The content of this curriculum drives uh, the methodology they use to teach. They let the content drive the methodology instead of uh, the other way around. Uh, and so as you might have gathered from this World War II section, talking about all of the things that had to get done in order to win World War II, and then this listing of subjects through all these course matter, there's far too much uh, material for any, any one person, any student to cover in depth in, in a year, let, maybe even a lifetime, right? And they are, they're very aware of that. Uh, so they know they have to break it up somehow in order to get it at all the subject matter that's required in order to win modern wars, to fight and win modern wars. Also, it should be kept in mind that the students themselves are quite a bit more senior. Now, the ranks are a little bit behind what we are right now because of, of the rank structure at the time, but the students are more senior. And they're at this point in their, their careers where they expected and where they were expected uh, to do the work of leading the military in time of war. Uh, so it's more about the doing the work. They're happy to learn, but they learned better by producing, by actually getting at the problems that they'd have to deal with, not just receiving lectures, although they got some of those, and, and then just, or, or having discussions. They wanted to work on stuff. Uh, so yes, they were, they were assigned readings and received lectures from a wide variety of experts inside and out of the Army War College. At the time, this was much easier uh, in terms, uh, until we sort of had this ability to connect electronically like we're doing right now. Uh, it was much easier because they were in Washington, D.C., so people could come in and see them uh, whenever they wanted. Uh, yeah, so they could bring in people, academics, people from the rest of the government to come in and talk to them. Um, but that wasn't the, the, but the primary mechanism for how they learned uh, that allowed them to cover more material in a more productive way was this thing called, was the committee work. We may call it problem-based learning to these days, uh, but it's through this uh, committee report. So for in each of the courses, for all of those courses, the faculty broke the students down into committees that would evaluate some of those specific issues that we talked about. They'd break them into parts. Uh, historical and contemporary, produce a written report, and then present that report uh, to the rest of the student body. Uh, in that way, all the students went deep into um, specific issues, but then got an overview of all the rest of the issues. They're familiar, at least familiar with all the rest of the issues, uh, but they went deep on one aspect of, of personnel, one aspect of intelligence, one aspect of operations, uh, one ap aspect of mobilization, and then they shared all of that uh, across the across the the fact that they would present this to the rest of the student body. The committees changed for every course, so everybody got a chance to be a leader of one of these committees, and which meant that they had to be the person who presented it, the report at the end to the rest of the student body. You can go back to the slide. A word more should be said uh, about the overall focus on this idea of a comprehensive war plan and the execution, the war gaming that would happen with it, and the exercises that would happen with it as the keystone of the curriculum. While the preparation for war courses covered a wide variety of material that far exceeded the bounds of any specific war plan, you know, some of the, the anti-war protests and things like that, all the material was taught with war planning in mind. 
That was why they often started the year with an introductory course that, that, started, that talked about what the content of a war plan would be, a full comprehensive war plan. The production and execution of war plans became a sort of anchor for the curriculum. So no matter how esoteric the lecturer or committee report, the students always had the challenge of figuring out how the material related back to the fundamental question of the planning. So this is them sort of working. I hear you could see. Uh, this is a New York Times headline from 1929, so the next year where they did this exercise, and you can see that the, uh, the invaders, the British again, uh, managed to, to make some ground because uh, they're playing both sides in this fight uh, when they do it. Uh, so no matter, they always had to go bring it back to, to the planning. Uh, by executing these war plans through the war games and map maneuvers, the students got to see the ways that the outbreak, mobilization, deployment, and conduct of even the most thorough plan never turned out exactly as expected, which gave them practice in reconsidering their work and being flexible in their approaches. This is what we now call reframing. So let's go to Eisenhower and see what he thought about the value of, of such war planning. So Eisenhower is very famous for a line, uh, you hear it a lot, uh, the line that plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And then usually this quotation is associated with the elder uh, Helmut von Moltke, the great Prussian generals, uh, aphorism that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. But that is not at all what Eisenhower meant. In fact, and this is a slightly different issue, which somebody could ask about in the questions they want, Eisenhower says the exact opposite uh, about wartime strategic planning. So what did he say? Uh, I can find two, I'm aware of two times in the historical record where we can directly attribute the line to Eisenhower. One was in the letter, a letter in 1950, where he wrote with a significant modifier that peacetime plans are of no particular value, but peacetime planning is indispensable. To further elaborate on what he meant, let's go to the second instance, the speech that you see, part of the port of this uh, speech you see before he gave it in 1957 as president. Plans are worthless, he told the audience, but planning is everything. The reason why is because uh, emergencies by definition are unexpected, so it won't match what you are planning. So the first thing you, you do is you take all the plans off the top shelf and throw them out the window and start once more. But if you haven't been planning, you can't start to work, intelligently at least. And then this is our sort of money part of this quotation. That is the reason it is so important to plan, to keep yourself steeped in the character of the problem that you may one day be called upon to solve or to help to solve. You must plan, you must learn, you must steep yourself in these problems, these types of problems. What all this war college education meant for Eisenhower was that even if he had only paid attention to the committees, you can put it back on me, uh, to, which, to which he belonged, uh, we know for a fact that he did more than that. He didn't just pay attention to his committees. Um, he would have had a pretty thorough grasp of the historical and current personnel, uh, industrial, military, and naval capabilities of the United States, the policies, history, and military capabilities of Mexico, this is just stuff he did, the nature of policy and strategy making to include the powers and responsibilities of the president and the War Department, classic and contemporary theories of war and strategy, which he wrote a big report on, and the historical and current operations of theater commands, how these theater commands worked in the past, uh, field armies and expeditionary forces and various contingencies all around uh, the world and at home. I won't go into any more detail beyond that about Eisenhower's specific committee work or even his individual writing assignment, which is a whole other issue that, that, uh, that carried on for him in his career. Um, nor even the many points uh, throughout his career as a staff officer, as a commander, and even president that he drew upon his, his education at the War College. You can look that up to see it. But the point is that I don't need to. You can go back to the slides, please. Eisenhower was not normal, obviously. Eisenhower's Eisenhower, right? He, he's, he's something special. But his War College education, his preparation for war was normal. Just over half of the roughly 1,800 officers who graduated in the 1920s and 1930s became general officers, mostly in World War II. In 1945, over, over 600 of the over 1,000 general officers in the military were graduates of the War College. Among them were Omar Bradley, George Patton, Breon Somerville, Leslie McNair, George Kenney, Admiral William Halsey went to both the Naval War College and the Army War College, Mark Clark, Matthew Ridgway, these are all names you've heard, and many, many others who you haven't heard of but all contributed to putting together this war effort. They all recalled having similar experience at Eisenhower and almost all gave credit to the content and instruction of the Army War College as expanding their horizons. They are the ones who oversaw the military mobilization in World War II. They ran selective service, trained and equipped all those inductees, deployed them as soldiers, sailors, and Marines all over the world. They filled the commands and staffs of the War and Navy departments, and more famously, the theater commands and the field armies, fleets, air forces, and corps that fought and won on the ground, on the oceans, and in the air against the mighty Axis powers. In other words, they did just exactly what they were prepared to do at the Army War College. 
because the Army War College prepared them for specific high-level military jobs in war, not just to be strategists generally. You can go, go back to me. That point needs expanding, and this is my last part on this. Uh, the last argument I want to make, last point I make about preparing strategists is this reminder that military strategists fight and win wars. That's what they do. Um, in, the wars after, in the years after World War II, all the way to the present, the Army War College and all of the war colleges have come to focus more generally on the idea of developing strategists and strategic thinkers and strategic leaders and the like. The problem is that no one has a clear understanding anymore about what strategy actually means, least of all for specifically military officers. Strategy has come to mean any sort of forward thinking or planning in politics, international affairs, business, personal life, workout programs, elementary school classrooms, and everything else. Everybody can be a strategist or a strategic thinker. And literally all of that can have nothing to do with the issues that the senior military officers dealt with in thinking about planning, executing, and fighting World War II. For educators of strategists, this definitional, definitional drift of strategy has primarily gone, primarily gone into what used to be the realm of policymakers. It has gone up, what we, we call everything strategy, including policymaking. As one historian of the uh, Army War College put it, by 1964, 1964, quote, the trend in the program has been away from the operational problems of an army in combat, away from the internal problems of the Department of the Army, away from the problems of war and mobilization planning, and toward the consideration of national security affairs in the broadest sense of that term. To put this in more stark terms for today, we now have a national military, a national security strategy, a national defense strategy, a national military strategy, and various theater strategies, among other uh, so-called strategic documents, all of which are actually policy documents and have next to nothing to say about, uh, nothing to do with fighting and winning specific wars. These documents, because they are called strategies, are often produced by graduates of the war colleges. So the war colleges teach their students, naturally, about them and how to write them, how to make them. So this trend becomes a sort of reinforcing loop, whereby these supposedly strategic documents produced by military professionals become more focused on non-military policies, not non-war policies, which then becomes a new standard for preparing strategists, so the war colleges work even harder uh, to teach them how to do those things, so they become less focused on military issues. And the new military strategists become more focused on non-war issues when they go out into their new jobs. And this loop has been circling for quite some time, which is why so many people nod their heads in affirmation these days uh, the idea that, quote, today's military professional, while first and always a soldier, must also be a diplomat, an economist, a scientist, a historian, and a lawyer. That was War College Commandant Eugene Sallet in 1967, but we still buy the line. In fact, we've added to it all kinds of other areas of expertise untethered from actual war. Now military professionals need to be strategic communicators, cyber warriors, international relations theorists, design gurus, ethicists, and so on. These ideas are not all wrong. I don't want to make that point. Some are very useful, but they are not the purpose of having and educating senior level, senior level military professionals. One time I heard an army general make uh, an interesting analogy about the army and what it does. He, sort of, he said that, that uh, when you call the fire department, uh, you expect fire trucks to show up and put out the fire. Uh, let me elaborate on this, uh, on what he means and what, what he was getting at in this analogy. I don't really know anything about firefighting, um, but I suspect there are hundreds of subjects that are peripherally related to how fire departments operate and hundreds of ideas that help them fight fires better. Now imagine you should call the fire department to put out a fire. And some firefighter who had just spent all of his training time studying structural engineering showed up and started describing to you how you built the, how, how you built the structure wrong, this building all wrong, in order to stop the spread of fires. That's nice, you'd say. I appreciate the, the feedback. Uh, but can you put out the fire, please? And he'd grudgingly go to work and probably get it done, but would not be as good as he could be. It would be more costly and less effective than it could have been if he had stayed focused on his actual unique capability which is putting out fires. The kicker is he'd go back after this and blame you for his struggles putting out the fire because you supposedly didn't build the building right. That is our military in too many ways. That is our education in too many ways. All of that broad, holistic, deep design system, strategic thinking in the world doesn't change the fact that militaries exist for the primary purpose of fighting and winning wars. Professional military officers are only or ought only be diplomats, historians, economists, scientists, international relations theorists, cyber warriors, and the rest, in so much as being so helps them better fight and win wars. That is their unique, discrete purpose. No other organization can do it. 
Yes, the military can do lots of other things, but at the core, when you call the fire department, you want fire trucks to show up and put out the fire. When the nation calls on the military, they expect the war fighters to show up and ready to win on ba in battles, on campaign, and in wars and on the in theaters of war. So what does that mean for developing military strategies? Let me be this very simple. Can you go back to the slide, please? An Eisenhower stern look for us. <laughs> Study and practice war. Military strategy, the so-called strategic level of war, is not about engagements in battles or even campaigns. Military strategy is about how to fight and win wars and in theaters of war. Therefore, military strategists are those, as the orientation said way back in Eisenhower's year, in command of large combat forces in time of war, as confidential advisors and assistants to such commanders, and as military advisors and assistants to those high governmental civil officials who are charged, who are charged by law with the responsibility of preserving the security of this nation. More specifically, that means preparing for the wartime command and staff responsibilities of joint task forces, field armies, fleets, air forces, marine expeditionary forces, geographic and functional combatant com and component commands, service general staffs, the joint staff, and the Office of Secretary of Defense, I would argue in that order. There are, these are the modern equivalents of the World War II military commands and organizations that raised a 12 million person strong military with overwhelmingly amounts overwhelming amounts of high quality war material, organized them into a dizzying array of military formations, deployed them across the globe, and led them through some of the most difficult and complicated military campaigns in all of human history. So sorry, Ike, I love you, you're wrong. America's unparalleled might in battle was no miracle, and you knew it. It was what military strategists were prepared to do. And that at the end of this all, uh, at the end of this all, is what they understood in the interwar period of the Army War College. We must understand that too. Thank you. And here, back to the dog so you guys will get too mad at me. Thank you very much, Dr. Brescino. That was uh, that was an excellent program. We've got some time for q and I want to remind everyone uh, that's out there listening that if you go to our Facebook page, the USAC Facebook page, uh, and uh, scroll down to tonight's lecture event uh, uh, post, you can see where we are taking questions. You can also directly... Uh, uh, message, Facebook message our, uh, our Facebook page, uh, and we'll get those questions to me. Uh, you can also email our primary email address. If you go to the AHEC website, usahec.org, you can shoot us an email and we will get that as well. So we've got 15, 20 minutes uh, to do some questions here. We're actually going to start off with a question directly from uh, the AHEC uh, director, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Mangelsdorf. Uh, Mr. Mangelsdorf says, uh, Dr. Brasino, thank you for your presentation. Some might say the War College generated unrivaled leaders during the interwar period. Do you see lessons learned that are not yet integrated in today's curriculum? Well, I, 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 we're good. Okay, yeah, I would. Um, I, I'm coming off pretty harsh on on us now uh, on some of the drift on this, and it, it shouldn't be that we don't teach uh, some of these a lot of these things. Uh, leadership is is a, is a difficult uh, subject. Uh, one of the things about leadership, and I don't teach that here, uh, except for that we all teach leadership. That's all part of what we're doing, and as everybody's a leader, that 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 is that is sort of the point. That's that's kind of got got to be where we're where we're at. Um, the point here is is not so much that. Uh, we don't teach leadership and in some ways teach it very, very effectively. Uh, the point is that uh, we don't necessarily relate it to specific tasks the way we should. Uh, and I think that they, and what they did in the interwar period was very, very closely focused on this, this kind of constant idea of putting yourself in the shoes of the people, of, of the jobs you would eventually hold or you might hold or that you might, or the types of, or the type of people you might be advising. So that you have a very good idea when you provide advice to them, and you're a you're a staff officer, you're thinking like a commander, like a leader. You know, uh, uh, you know what we probably do a little bit better now is focus on sort of leadership within, uh, within your sort of small groups. We do that pretty well, um, so that that certainly is helpful. Uh, but that idea of, of focusing on you know the the unique specific leadership dilemmas at these higher levels, uh, you know, it, it's it's not for nothing that you know Eisenhower actually goes through. You know, we could, we I won't ask you to put the slide back up, but we could go back to that slide of, of those courses. And Eisenhower serves in almost all these sections. Oh, we don't have to. I mean, you know, he ends up. I'll put this up. Why not? Here we go. 
Uh, I mean, he ends up, you know, going and, and, and well, actually, Chief Staff of the Army, too. But he's a commander who could be in that spot of Chief Staff of the Army. He is, he is a Chief of Staff of a, of a Corps, I believe, in, in an Army in a maneuver. He goes to the War Plans Division. Uh, when the war starts, he serves in the Assistant Secretary of, of War's uh, office and helps out there, too, uh, works on some plans. So he had a very, he used all of this. Uh, so that was that point of that ability of, of sort of seeing seeing those jobs, leading in those specific roles. That's what's sort of missing. I'll get back to the camera, probably. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that one. Uh, our next question is coming off our email. Uh, is there anything about the 1927 to 1928 Army War College academic year that with World War II in hindsight, you could think the Army War College should have or could have done differently or better? I was thinking about this on the way over. I think um, it's almost a more, right? There's a, uh, one of the things they were very hesitant to do in that period was to think about uh, a, a specific deployment to Europe. Again, another sort of fight in Europe or you know, in, in the Europe, what would be the European theater. Um, I think that they, you know, and, and this is an important lesson, you know, they were very good with War Plan Orange and all of the sort of permutations of the potential war with Japan. But what they hadn't really thought about was what a war with uh, on continental Europe would look like in detail. So why not swing for the fences here a little bit? You know, if you're going to make up a, a war plan to fight Great Britain at home, you know, why not, you know, do a little bit more with War Plan Black, which is the Germany, um, the Germany uh, fight. Uh, and then maybe even the Russia, the Soviet Union wants to. Again, you know, the situation might not might not merit it at the time, uh, but I still think you could sort of make that case. Uh, you know, and you know, I, I, it doesn't take much for me to say we could do the same thing these days. We could come up with a whole range of real world scenarios uh, that are, you know, that are extremely plausible or highly unlikely, and they would all be of some value in teaching us thinking about as as as. Uh, as Eisenhower said, being sort of deeply steeped in this, in the types of problems that you have to deal with. So that, that might be one where you say that they, they probably could have done a little bit more with thinking about Germany and the Axis powers, what would become the Axis powers there. All right, we have another one coming here. So uh, this is uh, going off of the first question we asked, but uh, what do you see as parts of uh, today's Army War College curriculum that is a direct holdover uh, from the policies and, and your teaching culture that uh, might be hold, held over even today from that period? Uh, well, not in terms of content, not all that much. There's some. I mean, it, to be fair to, uh, to all of us and what we're dealing with, um, you know, when it comes to sort of the mobilization issue, let's, let's start with that. So let's come to the mobilization. So start with like personnel. Um, you know, after Vietnam and after the, the demise of, the, of this first sort of peacetime draft, and we have Vietnam, that, and we have wars that are during this time, but we have this general running draft that ends in 1973. There's this idea we're never going to do that again. We're going to have this all-volunteer force we talk about as a national treasure. Uh, and, and for a long time, it made sense. Like, hey, we're not going to go back to a draft for a long time. But, but it's, it's incumbent upon military leaders to still focus on that, but we don't. Um, and except for you know, some students in ones and twos do this um, here and there. Um, same thing with industrial mobilization, same issue. You know, you end up with this kind of idea of merchants of death in the interwar period, but they kind of ignore that uh, and say, hey, we've got, a, you know, we've got a plan for this anyway. But after Vietnam, you end up with this kind of, you know, the conspiracy theorists that, that, that you know, the military industrial complex drove us into Vietnam. Therefore, we're, gonna, we're not going to focus on this mobilization because this mass mobilization is big business, big money for, the, for all these uh, uh, defense contractors. So we, we're going to focus more on procurement. And now what we talk about a little bit more is defense management. And a lot of that makes sense, right? It makes sense because of that was the situation. But again, there's value in planning for the extreme, uh, for what do you do in, this, in, the, in these large extremes. So we have these carryovers, but they're less. When it comes to the actual fighting, a uh, part of what has happened is that since we carved up the world and we look at the world in our combatant commands these days, uh, our military is constantly engaged all around the world uh, through these combatant commands. And, and so you know, while I'm telling them to prepare for the war, uh, this is what makes for good strategists. Uh, this one makes you better in peacetime. You know, most of the time when they go off to these jobs in combatant commands, if you're in, you know, the pay, Central Command or Pacific, Indo-Pacific, Indo-Pacific Command, Indo-PACOM Indo now, uh, European Command, 
a lot of time you're spending, you're, you're doing policy type things. You're doing this sort of day to day, what has been called day to day or peacetime or, or now we call it competition type uh, efforts. Uh, engagements with foreign powers, you know, sort of making deals with you know, uh, developing foreign militaries, uh, working on um, bilateral agreements, things like that, multilateral agreements, things like that. Uh, so they're doing that stuff, so we want to prepare our guys for that. But my point is that uh, like, all of those things are done better uh, when you understand you know, uh, the, the, the primary purpose of the military. Your, still, your job is still to prepare for the fights there, and that all of this other stuff falls out of that. Uh, you're, you're better at that. Uh, you're, you, you deter war better when you're prepared for the most extreme types of wars you can, when you're confident you can fight them. Um, or you're not, not confident, you've got to, you, know, you know how you're going to figure out how to do it once it starts. So that's, that's really where you see that. Um, but, but really, the, the content has changed pretty dramatically. Um, content has changed pretty, pretty dramatically, to answer your question. Uh, the, the methodology has changed uh, almost completely, although we're experimenting a little bit more with some of this problem-based stuff and getting back to some war planning, war gaming, uh, whether we call it that or not, and then some of this more committee-based approach. We experimented with some of that this year. Uh, so hopefully some of that will uh, be able to come back. I think it really works better than, there's nothing wrong with seminar learning. You can do some pretty good discussions and teach people, but I think that um, at this level in their careers, you know, colonels uh, really want to engage stuff, get their hands on and solve, work on problems and practice working on problems. Sometimes their work can, can bleed over and become actual solutions or, or, or approaches of things, how we do things. Um, but regardless, they have a chance to work on these problems. So when they go out there, they, it's not their first rep when they get out to their next job. I've got a couple messages uh, saying that we've got some more questions coming in. In the meantime, I've got a question myself. Right. Um, in your research, did any instructor specifically jump out at you or, or even influence Eisenhower himself? Uh, you know, we talked a, l a lot today, tonight about uh, what was taught and how it was taught. Do you, do you have any individuals you'd want to point out? Uh, interestingly, so Eisenhower, from Eisenhower's perspective himself, it's a great question. Um, so one of the, the interesting things about the, the, the instructional style was that a lot of the guys themselves, the instructors, were, were barely more experts on this stuff than, than the students. Um, uh, they were experts in their very narrow areas, which is still kind of the, the way it is. And so when they gave lectures, uh, they talked, or, or they, when they did instruction, they usually talked about their very narrow areas of, of, of expertise, and then they helped the students with their uh, projects and their research and the committees. Uh, so that the students could present the stuff. And then everybody was kind of learning and they were all learning together. Uh, that said, there were some senior people around. World War I had left over a, a bunch of guys who came and, and, and talked. So when they talked about, you know, what is the role of a G3 in a field army uh, in World War I, you could, have, uh, you could have the G3 of First Army come and talk. It could be George C. Marshall come and talk. Uh, you could talk who's the chief staff of a field army. You'd have Hugh Drum. You know, you could have the, the War Department guys could come and talk at the War College about what they did in the war itself. Uh, so that was very helpful. Now Eisenhower specifically said he was he pointed out being influenced by the Commandant William Connor, uh, General William Connor, not Fox Connor. Uh, they're often confused. Uh, Commandant William Connor, uh, who, uh, who was pretty actively engaged with the students very clearly, especially in that sort of conduct of the war plan, the, the uh, war gaming phase when they went out on the ground. They actually went out and did this big survey. Uh, Eisenhower later wrote wrote to him during World War II and talked about how. Uh, some of the stuff that that Connor had told him influenced him in how he looked at the how he looked at his problem as a commander in, in North Africa, uh, and then there was actually a lecture that he got from a from a uh, academic uh, that that really sort of triggered his kind of a, um, his anti-communism, his sort of realization that communism was a much larger threat, which was not a very commonly understood thing in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it was some people understood it, but uh, Eisenhower said it was sort of a, a, a large moment for him in his is anti-communism. So his name was Edmund Walsh. Was the name of that uh, I gave that lecture. There's a Walsh school at Georgetown that's that he started after Foreign Service officers. So we got uh, one more question that came through. Um, this one's from one of your colleagues at the War College. Um, Tom, your thoughts on the Chilcote article, Ghostwriter Steve Metz on strategic leaders, three personae: uh, strategic theorist, strategic practitioner, and strategic leader. Is your focus on practitioner or a developing a bench of officers for each role? Uh, no, I think that I think that that's that point, right? That that's uh, practitioner, leader, theorist. Uh, we use advisor sometimes. We sort of throw into these into these lists. Those are all true. 
uh, but they're all they're all too vague. Uh, that that's my that's my uh, kind of problem with it. You know, it's uh, you can as you look at your role uh, as a commander or as a, a, a logistician or you know doing sustainment uh, for uh, large operations or for doing mobilization, uh, you're informed by being a uh, by by theory by history. Um, in order to get the things that you figure out how to do, you have to you have to have some some ability at leadership, and, and and you have to be focused on leading people through doing those efforts. And leadership is different in each of these cases, right? So so being a leader, um, being a being a leader of of an organization that's dealing very heavily with civilian organizations in order to to manage and run mobilization is a different dilemma than being a you know, than being a a core commander. Uh, that's some different things you're trying to do. You know, Eisenhower's in that kind of sweet spot, right? So a lot of people critique Eisenhower for not, uh, you know, so, so Eisenhower is most certainly a diplomat uh, as a commander, but only in so much as it helps him, you know, command the, the theater and the European theater of operations to be the supreme allied commander, uh, uh, supreme commander of the allied expeditionary forces in, uh, in, in Europe. So he's a diplomat in the sense of like, hey, I have to deal with, I have to deal with de Gaulle, I have to deal with Churchill, I have to do, I have to do these roles, and he's informed by all kinds of theories. Uh, you know, some of this is civil military relations and how they work in different countries. Uh, some of this is about uh, interpersonal relations, and so all of those things that help inform you do that are all fair game, and they're all things we should do. But they are all sort of built around um, about around being uh, doing the fighting the actual wars, fighting and winning these actual wars. Uh, and so that's 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 where the emphasis would be for me. I, I don't have a problem with those roles. Um, I just think that they sort of lack specificity, uh, because you could easily say that being a you know a, it's very easy in these days. This really falls into it. That you think, and it's almost as if we're all preparing. We're, we're preparing too many of our officers to go off and and you know sort of whisper in the ear of the Secretary of Defense or the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, which is a role that vanishingly few are ever going to have. And there's other people who can do that role and the military, and, and you can only do that role from that military perspective if you understand the military perspective uh, deeply. And that, that's sort of that point that I, that I would make about that. So Dr. Rossino, I fibbed a little bit. We actually have a couple more questions Excellent. that uh, I just can't pass up because I'm interested to know what, uh, sure. what you have to say as well. So the next one, uh, there's so many more military schools today compared to the interwar period. We've got CGSC, the Army War College, SAM, SAS, JAWS, the Eisenhower School, et cetera. Are there any programs that are closer to what you have in mind for training senior warfighters? No. Um, so uh, having some experience with it, I mean, I guess maybe maybe JAWS. I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the, the Joint Advanced Warfighting School to, to, to know, but I, I haven't seen it. I could be wrong about that, um, and then I think that's too. But I, but it, it it's it doesn't matter whether there's specific schools that do that uh, at the at this at the level I'm talking about. Now, Sam certainly Sam's saw uh, the Marine Corps equivalent, the School of Advanced Military Studies. Now, the truth is they actually had pretty much all the schools you mentioned uh, at that time. Uh, the, the Leavenworth went back and forth, but sometimes was two years. The second year was a lot like what the School of Advanced Military Studies was like. The Command General Staff College, and you had. A second year, um, there was a, an Army Industrial College, which is the uh, part of the Eisenhower School. Um, yeah, uh, the uh, the Industrial College, of the Armed Forces. It became there is a Naval War College. There's the Air Corps Tactical School, which is more than just tactics. Uh, so they do actually do uh, quite a bit of stuff. Um, but it, regardless, it doesn't matter. Uh, the focus at Leavenworth is primarily on uh, and, and should be. Uh, the first year, Command General Staff College, and we could, that's a whole separate discussion, uh, should probably be on, on the operations divisions, should, they should be built around divisions, brigades divisions, uh, and how they operate uh, in the Army, and then maybe start peeking into corps and joint task forces. The School of Advanced Military Studies is focused mostly on, on starting to get in much more specifically into corps uh, and sometimes field armies, um, but is but does not get into theater strategy. That's not its role, is to do theater strategy, let alone national military strategy, how we do the overall war effort. Uh, that is the role that, that has to be filled by the war colleges. The war college, no one else does it. It is the actual unique, discrete capability of the, of, of the war colleges, it's the opportunity to do it. So the fact that there might be a few people here and there who get it is not the point. The point is, is that it required everybody to have at least some familiarity with it. All of the people who would be responsible in the war 
to have some familiarity with it. You can, you can learn some tactics a lot more on the fly. We can train things. It's not ideal, but you can do it. It's extremely difficult to take this sort of lifetime of work and figure out how to fight a war uh, just on the fly without having done this. Like, oh, well, war broke out now. All this prep I did to do economics and, and international relations theory is not really helping me that much with actually you know, making sure that I can get, uh, you know, get forces overseas in a position where they can fight and win, uh, ho hopefully overseas, if we have if we wars. All right, now we really do have our last question. Uh, any thoughts about comparing the size of the War College student body from then and now? Uh, the, the size just drives this point. I mean, the, the, the mechanics of teaching would be a little different. It'd be, it'd be extremely difficult to have each committee briefing uh, a, a student body that's two and a half times the size or so uh, of what it was then. Um, uh, the bigger problem would be composition. Some of this, the difficulty would be with all the international officers in it, uh, but it's a problem that can be solved. We, we like having the international officers. It's wonderful that we have, uh, we have, we have se uh, senior uh, senior officers from all around the world who come to the War College. It helps provide perspective. It really fills in uh, some different ideas of how theories work, how wars are fought. We could use them more that way, I believe. Uh, they could provide perspective on their wars and potential um, potential alliances and things that would work against us. Now, when it comes to the actual fighting of a war plan doing a, 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 and fighting on an exercise, we might have to exclude some here and there and do that sort of stuff. But it's also things we could figure out. We could also have build them in for them. Uh, programs for them to help prepare them better. Um, so that's probably the biggest impediment is probably the, the, the sort of the character of the student body. Um, but it, even now, I mean, I think it's great that we have civilians who are related to our war making capabilities, but we don't we don't sort of press them for that too. Like, hey, what is what is our role? How do we work this together? Um, we had we we experiment with some of that this year, and again, had some great success with using civilians to help sort of fill gaps that military people don't see at these at sometimes in these at these uh, strategic levels and these higher level commands. All right, so that was an absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. We very much appreciate it. I want to remind everybody listening out there uh, that the paper that this uh, talk is based on and that this paper or this talk expands on is available on the AHEC website. If you navigate to USAW, uh, I'm sorry, USAHEC.org and click on the event uh, the events page and go to the upcoming events page for this lecture. Uh, you will be able to find a link where you can actually download the paper, uh, give it a read, and then come back and re-watch uh, this video when we put it up on YouTube uh, sometime later this month. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We look forward to further online events with you. Please keep an eye on our social media pages and the events tab on our website to learn more about our upcoming events. Thank you and good evening. Thank you.